Welcome to the Crypto News. In today's video, Raul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision, shares his latest thoughts about cryptocurrency. We're sort of having a conversation at the moment about how the mainstream media has uh, somewhat falsely portrayed uh, the crypto market and seems to be driving the narrative that they're, he based, Jeff basically said Bitcoin, Doge and SHIB, and that's what you hear about. I'm curious your thoughts. Um, yes and no, but it changes at the margin, right? If you if you to go back two years and look at the narrative, then a year ago, then now, then to Goldman Sachs's homepage being about digital assets. You know, <laughs> the world is waking up. Jeff, as Jeff said, is a lot of the journalists are behind and they're forced to write stories because crypto is engaging. And so they come at it with not enough knowledge yet. But you know, over time, I'm seeing more and more people getting a little more comfortable with the space. But Journalists have this habit of always wanting to find a balance to a story so that they use the FUD, even though most of it is completely wrong, as their balance, as opposed to writing something more nuanced. And I think that, that that's the issue. But over time, at the margin, it's changing. And the, and the FUD is rolling, right? I mean, it, always. last year it was, it was energy and China, etc. Now it's sanctions or, or choose what you want. But why does it always have to be some well, sort because, of... Because, you know, if you go back and think where narratives come from. They don't come from nowhere. So where did the narrative about energy use come from? Because obviously it's ludicrous. I think if everybody put on their kettle at the same time, we'd use more energy around the world than crypto mining, right? So Bitcoin mining. It actually came, I believe, from the ECB or within the European institution because they wanted to slow adoption and they've got an ESG mandate. So if they knew it would bump up against that ESG mandate, they could slow adoption. And they're not trying to slow adoption necessarily to stop it, but just to give buy them time to figure stuff out because they're feeling like they're out of control of a situation that's moving too fast. So that's what they're doing. And now sanctions is another way is, you know, they're going to use this for bad gains. What they're trying to do is like, please stop adopting it. But meanwhile, when you go to Wall Street, they're adopting it really fast now. Um, you know, having spent a lot of time in that world and still speaking to a lot of people, whether it's the giant asset management firm, whether it's the um, giant pension schemes or the investment banks themselves. So basically, you know, those guys don't make a move without the regulators giving them the nod saying it's fine. Of course, yeah. It's, so it's really, it's just tactics. It's tactics in a situation where technology is going so fast that they don't know how to keep up with it. Because, I mean, they still haven't regulated, they still haven't ruled on bloody Ripple. And what are yeah. they going to do with all of the DAOs, all of the NFTs, the social tokens? You know, it's they're so far behind that they're going to have to draw the line somewhere. Because what are they going to do? Just keep fining everybody, give them a slap on the wrist and letting them move forward? And this goes on in perpetuity? I get it. It's a tax. So they're going to do that a bit. And that's fine. That's the cost of doing business in the end. Everybody in the space kind of understands that. But at some point, they have to draw the line. I, I think the narr how the narratives get set is is really important because we're seeing entrance from everywhere right now, right? Whether it's Citadel saying they're going to make markets, or you know Pimco and BlackRock saying that they're getting pressure to start investing, or it's you know new custody from BNY. I mean, I mean we we know the entrants are coming, we know the investors are coming, we know the service providers are coming, the banks and brokers they're all coming, right? And you know uh, I didn't even realize that Goldman on their on, the, on their home page is now talking about digital assets. That's awesome, right? And, and obviously you're seeing you know you're seeing reports from the you know second and third tier guys like your BTIGs to you now you know JP Morgan's and Morgan Stanley's like it's all coming. But the most important narrative right now that I think that is going to lead to the biggest aha moment as well as like everyone saying in retrospect that was obvious is what happened in the last six weeks with regard to Canada basically freezing out their own citizens. Russia basically you know a, a, a small group of, 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 of oligarchs basically deciding that they were fine just tanking their their currency and their economy to you know the US and Europe and the sanctions through SWIFT. Um, to even what happened on the London Metals Exchange, right? The LME just flat out canceling, you know, a bunch of positive PL on shorts in, in, in Nipple. What you're basically saying is um, the world is now waking up to the fact that what you thought were your assets are not your assets. What your your assets are somebody else's liability, and whether or not they pay off that liability is now in question, right? Whether or not your government, your bank, your exchange, your brokerage. Whether or not they actually release those assets to you is now in question. And that is going to be the biggest driving narrative of the adoption of bearer assets and digital assets that we've ever seen. And I really believe that there is a very good chance that when ETH is at 10,000 and Bitcoin's at 200,000 in you know, maybe as soon as like 12 months, you're going to look back and say, well, yeah, based on what happened in January and February of 2022, that was obvious. I mean, Jeff, I mean, the reason I got into Bitcoin originally back in 2012-13 
with Cyprus, it was exactly the same. They took the entire savings out of the banks and said, it's ours now. And I realized that we didn't own anything. So yeah, I mean, these, and you know, what happened after Cyprus obviously was a huge run in crypto for the same reasons. I think you're dead right. Yeah. So I think, I think that narrative is really going to start sleeping in, um, you know, and, and right now it's a footnote rather than the story. Right. Um, and I'm forgetting the guy's name, but the, uh, the, the strategist at Credit Suisse who just wrote that, you know, Bretton Woods. Zoltan. Um, Zoltan, yeah. Um, you know, it, Bitcoin was literally a footnote at the bottom of the article, right? It was like four or five pages all about what money means and Bretton Woods one, two, and now three. And, and it was like, I think the, the line was, if Bitcoin still exists, it'll be bullish for Bitcoin, right? And it was like, a, you know, a little tongue in cheek. It, it's going from a footnote to the main event. Um, and we're feeling it with uh, the, the amount of inbound interest we're getting from investors. We're feeling it in terms of the conversations we're having with investors. You, you know, again, the, the, the pressure that the non-crypto native asset managers are feeling from your Black Rocks to your PIMCOs to offer products. Um, I mean, it is, it is bubbling. And it may not be explicit yet where it's like, this is, ob this is an obvious moment to get in, but it's going to be in retrospect, an obvious turning point. And also, I think there's the other thing at the same time that's come, which was the shift from using crypto and digital assets to this soft term of Web3. It's much easier for regulators to say, of course, we should upgrade to Web3. If we're on Web2 now and Web3 is better, we should do it. It doesn't have the word currency in it, which was the big toxic word. Um, and so I think that creates a decent Trojan horse as well to make it easier for people the regulators or the politicians particularly to say, yes, you know, we need to be pioneers in Web3 as opposed to we need to be building cryptocurrencies. So I think those two things, the narrative, which is, as you said, the core case of why these digital assets really matter, plus this new kind of fancy dressing for it all. I, I think this is a very significant moment. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany, as you can hear, and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy, but the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who, and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.